Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Emacs.L. And in today's guest, we have Mr. John Wigley. And for those who are not familiar with uh, Mr. John Wigley, he is the current and the newest uh, Emacs maintainer. So, uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? <laughs> uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Uh, I've been using Emacs for quite a long time. I first used it, I think, in 1987 about. Um, not as long as some of the people I know who have used it. but have been a devotee of it ever since. All right. Um, yeah. There's not that much else to say. I've just been a computer programmer my whole life, but Emacs Lisp is one of the more fun languages I've ever used. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right, so I'm just going to go ahead uh, straight into the questions. So, uh, so how did you get into Emacs? Do you want to go into a little bit more of that? Well, when I was a teenager, I worked a summer job double time so that I could make enough money to buy a next station, which was my first Unix workstation I ever had. And the editor it came with was Emacs. <laughs> so, so Steve Jobs then indirectly uh, introduced me to Emacs. And that was how I got started with it. I think it was version 18.50 that came on the machine. Wow. <laughs> I, did, I didn't right. get into Emacs Lisp, though, and programming Emacs until a few years later. There was a friend of mine uh, named Wendell Hicken, and he introduced me to sort of the Lisp side of Emacs. And that's when I started reading the Emacs Lisp manual and playing around with writing modes. Mm. So I'm guessing you've seen a lot of the uh, changes that Emacs has gone through throughout the years, right? Yeah. <laughs> all right. A lot of good changes. A lot of good changes. All right. Everybody. Hopefully all for the better, right? <laughs> yeah. The move from 18 to 19 was pretty big, and the move from 19 to 20 was equally huge in terms of usability and improvements and uh, features added. Yeah, I, I remember reading, uh, seeing some posts from way back from like pre, because uh, when I started using it, it was uh, Emacs 24. Mm -hmm. So from what I've heard and from the posts that I've seen, uh, it was actually a pretty good thing that I got into that version because the previous ones as well were a little bit harder to install packages from what I remember. Oh, yeah, the package manager. That's right. That was a big initiative. Yeah, so it looks like I joined uh, joined Emacs at the right time. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's never All right. a long time. <laughs> All right, so um, so yeah, so I'm gonna go straight into the questions that I, I got from uh, Reddit. So I, I posted a, a a post on Reddit to ask what questions people wanted to ask you. So I just collected uh, some, uh, the questions and put them on the doc, and that's what I'm gonna ask. Okay. So the first one is basically, what are the most important goals for Emacs in the coming years, and what are the things that you personally wanna see happen in Emacs? Uh, the number one goal for the future that I have in my mind and what I also want to see happen for Emacs is improving stability. We've got about 3,700 open bugs, I think, in Emacs. And not necessarily all of them are still bugs or are important to fix, but getting that number down is... It, if, it, if at the end of a few years we could get that number down into the, low, into the hundreds, into the three digits, I will consider... Uh, having done a good job as maintainer. I, I prioritize that over adding new features or taking Emacs in new directions. All right, sweet. So yeah, bug fixes, that is very important for anything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I, right. and I will also say, too, that we're looking for people of any skill level to assist in that. So there are a couple people, actually, who have stood, stepped up, and they're, they are going through the bug database and just trying out what every bug, de what every bug describes as the problem and either closing it if it's uh, not a problem or marking it that they couldn't reproduce it and then if nobody comes back to claim that it is still a problem in a few weeks, they will close it or they provide the better reproduction steps. So just walking through the entire bug da database to do that has already closed hundreds of bugs because they just weren't issues anymore. So the more people that we have to do that, the easier it'll be to get through that uh, enormous bug load. Oh, nice. So already closing issues. Oh, wow, that many? Over hundreds of issues already yeah. closed? Well, it was, it was in, I think it was 4,400 when I first looked at it before all of this started happening. And then uh -huh. a couple people joined in. We had three people actively culling bugs, and it took down the number by several hundred. Wow, that is, that is pretty impressive. That's, well, I mean, that's you nice. You don't have to be able to code in C. You don't have to be a mainline Emacs developer. You just have to read the bug, do what the bug says, and then 
make notes on the bug to say what you saw when you tried it. You don't have to even program at all to do that job. Nice. Yeah, definitely. So it's it's nice to see that uh, people are finally starting uh, uh, to help with uh, Emacs, not just uh, users, but also help contribute to it, whether right. it's just doing bug, fi bug fixes. So yeah, that's that's pretty sweet. That's pretty awesome. All right. So on the Reddit post, I think this is just a directly a quote. Uh, so I'm just going to read it. So it said that recently he's, uh, he, meaning uh, you, John, mm -hmm. said that when you met with uh, Richard uh, Stallman, you had some ideas about the future direction of Emacs, and you expected uh, Stallman to shut them down, but you were surprised that he was actually uh, welcoming of them. So would you mind telling us what were those ideas? I'm not sure uh, if you get the context of that, that question, what I meant. One of the things that oh, I have to remember back now, what was the thing that I had, came, I had come to him to ask? It wasn't necessarily a feature I wanted to see happen. I just wanted to discuss the technical feasibility of it. Like, for example, what if we used Haskell instead of C as the background language for Emacs? And rather than just his reaction being, oh my gosh, I, uh, how terrible that would be, he just stopped for a second, looked at me, and then said, well, does Emacs really fit the functional paradigm well? Would we gain any benefits from using that language? You know, it was a very thoughtful way of turning it back and just sort of wanting to look at it from different angles to see what would the feasibility of it be. I don't necessarily think that's a direction I would want to go in anyway, but I was sort of also testing to see what his attitude would be towards what might you might consider crazy ideas, just to get a sense for whether I'd be getting pushed back from him if I had suggestions like that in the future. But no, no, he, he considers things very openly. So we had a very pleasant discussion about functional programming, actually, and about other GNU projects where it might possibly come into play. All right. So is uh, Haskell being into Emacs or no? <laughs> no, no, I don't think Haskell is no. going to become a part of uh, the Emacs core languages at, at any time. OK, all right. <laughs> Just making sure. All right. So. Oh, so this one's uh, rather recent. I just think I saw it a couple of days ago. So I saw that uh, X widgets was merged into Emacs. Correct. So I, from that, I saw a couple of posts and a couple of tweets as well that that could potentially mean that we can finally have like a like a nice browser in Emacs. So I'm not sure if you saw those posts or any of those. So yes, yes. Yeah. So yes. what do you think of that? You want to elaborate on that, or you would be able to embed a browser window within an Emacs window using the X widget support. You should actually even be able to embed Emacs itself within an Emacs window, some other Emacs that you'd be running. So any, anything that can present itself in, as an X widget could be embeddable within an Emacs buffer. OK, all right, sweet. Is there anybody working on, uh, on, on playing with X widgets and creating something uh, like, a, like a browser? Or was it just left there, and then they'll come back to it later? Or how is that? Uh, I forget what the primary motivation was to provide that support. It was something different. It wasn't a browser. But the main a maintainer of that, of that feature has been playing around with different possibilities. I, I even think I saw him demo it once at one of the conferences that I went to. But if people have suggestions or neat things they want to try out, come over to the Emacs developer list and just ask about how you can make it happen. I'm sure it would be cool to demo uh, Firefox running inside of an Emacs window. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, sweet. <laughs> so browser, I uh, can't wait for that. <laughs> All right. So now next question is basically um, there's these things called bug bounties. So for those of you, for those who aren't familiar with bug bounties, they're basically say, here's a bug. And if you're able to fix it, you get uh, some amount of cash, whether it be uh, like $5 or maybe like 20 or 30 or even more. So is, th is that something that... Uh, would uh, might be implemented in uh, Emacs. I know that it probably won't, but you know, it's just a question to ask that some people had. Right. Well, that would really be something to ask the Free Software Foundation, since they they fund the, the Emacs project and all of its various servers. I really don't. I'm really not in a position to make financial uh, decisions about the project like that. Although, if some if some person wished to personally sponsor bug development in that way, that would be totally up to them. And then they could decide how much different bugs would be worth. 
Okay. All right. Also, for also with that question, um, do you think personally, if someone uh, would, if such a person would to step up, do you think that that could also harm um, the development in a way that the con that the person contributing to it financially could potentially guide the development of Emacs since he is placing specific bounties on specific bugs or things of that nature? Yes, I would worry that people would try to be hasty. Uh, because the goal there would be to fix the bug as quickly as possible, not necessarily to do the right fix or to be patient with the many weeks of discussion that sometimes takes place with a difficult bug. Sometimes bugs are a little bit subtle, and so what might seem like an obvious answer is not necessarily the right answer. And being willing to just wait and have the, have the discussion with other developers to make sure that you're following the right course. If a person were pursuing bugs to make an income, then that would basically go against their, their motive because it would delay their payment. So I, I want the bug and the problem the bug is addressing to be the priority, not, okay. not some extrinsic motivating factor. All right, all right. Fair enough. All right, so with the, with the follow-up question to that one uh, kind of related to financially, I've seen some projects, some open source projects that have been funded by uh, Places such as Kickstarter, so basically they send a goal and they say, "Hey, I need uh, fifty thousand to work on this project for six weeks, and I'll solely devote myself to this." Do you think uh, you or uh, the Free Software Foundation, or or something along, let's say they create a Kickstarter or something like that, um, do you think potentially you or maybe getting someone else to work on Emacs for, let's say? six months straight, um, just that. Do you think that would be possible or even consider that idea? Well, it sounds interesting. Um, I think that would be more, I'm, I'm trying to think here, how, how that would kind of, how that would work. I, there are certain individuals whom I would love to hire if I had the money to only work on Emacs because they spend so much time already and do such a great job that I'd love to free them from their daily grind. But I'm not sure I have a particular project in mind the way that those Kickstarter projects get started. I mean, if all I said was, let's hire somebody to fix 2,000 bugs, for example, or fix, fix as many bugs as they can get done in one or two years, that's not very sexy. And I don't see a lot of people wanting <laughs> to necessarily put money toward that. Um, rather than having a lot of people put that money in, I'd like to see just a whole bunch of people give a little bit of time to step in, do the bug herding that I mentioned before, do proofreading on the manuals. I, I don't know that money is going to solve the problems that we're having with Emacs right now. Uh, so, I mean, if, if I thought that were a big silver bullet and maybe that is something to think about more, then that would be something to talk with the Free Software Foundation about. But I don't really have a clear opinion on it right now. Okay, yeah, that's understandable. Yeah, yeah. so let's see. All right, so when I was starting with uh, Emacs, uh, to be honest, I don't even remember how I even heard of Emacs. I just I just remember I started using it. I don't even remember how I got it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so one of the things that I realized with Emacs is that there's basically no advertising of Emacs. It's basically word of mouth, or you or you read it in a post or something about uh, BIM and Emacs, and then uh, say, hey, what's Emacs, or what's BIM, and you Google it, or whatever. Right. Uh, and that's probably how I found out about it. I don't even remember. But um, basically, one of the things is that when GitHub came out with its editor, uh, Atom, it basically did massive advertising. I mean, I would see it. Uh, they, uh, I got it on my email. I saw it on my Twitter stream. I saw it when I logged into GitHub. They basically did this basically massive advertising towards uh, Atoms. And because of that, I think that a lot of people were able to create packages for Atom and I think after a while, like a year or something, the, I saw a tweet that said, oh, Adam has only been released a year, but it's already have over like 3,000 packages, and that's more than Melpa for uh, Emacs, and that's been around way longer. And basically, it was kind of uh, saying, oh, look, Adam is much better because it has all these packages all together. But I think that the main reason because of that was because GitHub did so much advertising for Adam, and there's virtually nothing on uh, on Emacs for advertising. So would you ever consider or ever uh, kind of uh, forward the idea of doing some type of advertisement for Emacs since, I mean, it's been there forever already, so, so yeah. Uh, 
What, what would we say? Uh, <laughs> Emacs is really, I don't know. That's a, that's a, good, that's a good question. <laughs> All right. We, we do have things like these podcasts or people doing webcasts. We do have people writing lots and lots and lots of blog posts. I'm not sure where we would put the ad. I mean, Adam is a very easy for thing for them to push because everybody comes to GitHub and they see, mm -hmm. they see the the site of the of the company that's offering this product. Where do we put the Emacs advertisements that we don't then have to also advertise for people to come go look at them? You know what I mean? It's like there's no central place for us to go to where we can say, "Hey, you should come use Emacs." Okay. <laughs> I mean, other than places where people are already saying, hey, you should go use email. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, the only true form of advertisement uh, from Emacs is basically word of mouth. I mean, even in my uh, classroom, when I did a presentation, uh, I needed to do some programming presentation. I basically used Emacs. And after that, um, my, my classmate came up to me and said, Dude, how did you do that? You moved so fast. You didn't even <laughs> lift your hand up. How did you do that? And I told them, hey, I just use Emacs. It's it's the best thing ever. He said, I am going to download it and try it. There you go. Well, hey, word of mouth is very effective. <laughs> yeah. People not only hear about the program, they also see your enthusiasm for using it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so he was basically blown away. He said, I didn't even see you lift your hand up. I mean, that was incredible. So yeah, I mean, that's the only true form of advertisement that I've ever seen on Emacs. Yeah. I've never seen anybody um, like doing advertising like such as GitHub or, or that or that big of a scope or anything sure. like that. Yeah. But I mean, uh, it's nice to, you know, uh, if we get advertising, we get more user. And if we get more users, we get more people contributing. So yeah, you know, just a thought. That's true. That's true too. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so maybe we should do a Kickstarter for advertising. Who knows? <laughs> All right, so let's see. Oh, yeah, so I believe you answered this question in the Reddit post that someone posted, but uh, just in case for those who didn't uh, who didn't read it or didn't see it, uh, it's basically how do you plan on getting the community closer, the Emacs user base closer? Um, that's a good question. I, uh, so the biggest thing that's happened recently is that Sacha Chua, uh, who I asked to sort of be our community ambassador between the core developers and the larger Emacs community, has been putting together a weekly Emacs news. There's a new mailing list called Emacs Tangents that we split off from the Emacs development mailing list to sort of cover ideas that are more uh, fun or, or frivolous than serious developer discussion. And Sacha posts her weekly news there every single week. And I've been using it as a resource for learning a whole bunch more about Emacs. And I think that has, had, that has been very integrative in that it's showing all of the things that are happening in sort of the Emacs world from these various different sources like Reddit, Hacker News, uh, the web, Google, various mailing lists, et cetera. So that's the most concrete thing that's happened recently toward that objective. OK. All right, sweet. Sweet. All right, so uh, the next question is basically, uh, you basically already answered uh, answered it at the beginning. <laughs> so <laughs> it's basically how can new contributors can get uh, started with the projects? But uh, like you said, it's basically just doing the hunting down the bugs and checking if the bugs are still valid, if, they, if they're still around, basically. Well, that's, that's one task. Another task is to come and proofread the documentation. Mm -hmm. uh, another one would be write up your experiences. If there's some feature that you find difficult to use, write a tutorial on what you went through to figure it out. And then maybe we could, maybe we could collect these tutorials together and do so, some form of ancillary documentation. There are a lot of things that can be done without just purely coding. But the yeah, two so big ones would be documentation and bugs. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I think uh, you're, you're right on the uh, writing post on you know, a step-on-step -step guide on how to do something on on Emacs, uh, I think that's also a great way to contribute to not just Emacs, but any project. Mm -hmm. so basically show how to do things. That way people don't just get discouraged and say, oh, you know what, I I'm forget it. I'm going to try something else or, or maybe even potentially even leave Emacs. So I think, yeah, that's a pretty good solid point. Have you discovered the Emacs wiki yet? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So well, there, there are some things like, there's some content like that up on the Emacs wiki. 
for various different subjects. Yeah, yeah uh, I've it's gone to a little to the bit hard to find sometimes if you don't know exactly what you're looking for, but it does have a great, a huge number of resources in that area. Yeah, it's definitely wide. <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty big place. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, oh, this is something that I actually found interesting. Uh, the questions when I was reading. So, uh, it's basically if you've thought about moving the Emacs uh, project to something similar to, I'm just going to use this as an example because most people know uh, GitHub. So I'm just going to use it as an example for no other reason than that. Basically, have you thought of moving Emacs, the project itself, into something similar to GitHub to make it uh, somewhat easier to, uh, to help new people uh, get started? For example, most like uh, open source projects today are mostly hosted on GitHub, and everybody's kind of familiar on how GitHub works. You know the issues and everything. It's all a nice UI and basically things like that of, of that nature. So, have you thought of doing of moving or uh, any of that at all? So, as you know, the new Emacs is a project of the Free Software Foundation, and the Free Software Foundation's primary goal is user user freedom that the software you have on your machine should be completely free for you to use, modify, and distribute. So until a service like GitHub is completely based on free software from top to bottom, that will never happen. Uh, right now, we have Savannah, which is our own sort of project repository that you can go to, to to get links to the issues, links to the repository, a browser for the code source repository. And that is free software completely. But any other service like GitHub, which relies upon proprietary software running on their servers, it'll just never be a part of what the new Emacs is. That's something users can use for their own sake if they wish to, but not something that would be endorsed by the project as a whole. OK. All right. I think uh, a site called Fabricator was uh, mentioned in the Reddit. But uh, I'm not so sure about the license issues. There were there was uh, some talking uh, among the users there that they that the Free Software Foundation uh, you guys could potentially move. But uh, uh, I didn't follow up too much on that post. So uh, uh, who knows? <laughs> right, and and we have an issue tracker already, and we are using Git already. I don't know what I don't know that moving to Fabricator would necessarily help our development process all that much. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sweet. So, oh, here we go. So there was, a, I think, like an arguing point made within that same uh, thread that they were talking about. So basically, they were saying that the mailing list has no way of integrating bug tracking and making uh, project managing, such as tasks, uh, code reviews, feeds, reports, chat, and all that kind of hard. That's um, true. That is true. Yeah, so basically they were making points like that about uh, you know why moving to something like that would potentially be better because it makes everything more manageable. So yeah, I forgot to read that part. <laughs> so it would have to be something that all of the core developers working on Emacs today would agree to want to use because Emacs moves forward based on their efforts. So even though a system might sound great in theory that it has all of these capabilities, if you suddenly enforce that on a bunch of people that they have to go through a huge process to learn how to use it, they may just decide that they don't want to, they don't want to continue working on Emacs for now because they don't have the time to master this new system. So there is a degree of inertia we have to take into consideration just because the people who are currently working on Emacs do have a system that works for them for the types of tasks they've been doing for many years. And we want to make their life as easy as possible since they're the people contributing, they're the people doing the work at the moment. Uh, if, if something like Fabricator, if someone can show a candidate use of it, maybe create a mock dummy site, then come to the Emacs development mailing list, say, hey, you guys who are working on Emacs, come take a look at this thing that I've set up. Does this make your life easier? And if it does make your life easier, then it's clearly something we would want to do as long as there's no licensing concern. Um, so that's why it's not purely just a technical decision. There's also a, a people factor involved here with people who are very comfortable with the tools that they currently use to do the next development. OK, all right. So for those of you that are interested in something like that, now you guys know what to do and see if you can convince uh, John and the others to move. <laughs> that's right. Emacs Develop is the place to come to propose ideas and to discuss. All right. Sweet. So, so 
also on the post on Reddit, there was uh, people were asking, what are your thoughts on uh, Gao Emacs? Now, I don't know much about Gao Emacs, so I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to say too much on this part. <laughs> uh, sure. So Gao is a scheme implementation. Uh, that's a project that's part of the GNU project. And it's used as the de facto scripting language for many GNU projects, many other GNU projects. The question has often come up, would Emacs use it as its scripting language? It has a lot of similarities with Emacs Lisp. It's not identical. In some ways, it has features that we don't have in Emacs Lisp, but there are some other niceties that Emacs Lisp gives us in the context of Emacs uh, that Guile didn't have for a long time. But recently, it has gained a lot of support. It now has an Emacs Lisp compatibility mode where it can read in and execute Emacs Lisp. There are really just a lot of uh, performance issues to be resolved in that in that support. Mm. There's been a conversion to Guile for Emacs with the Guile Emacs project, which claims to run pretty complex packages such as org mode and GNU's. The question will really be, can the performance issues be resolved? And can it merge in all the latest work that we've been doing with Emacs? And can it demonstrate itself as an adequate replacement? I would love to see a Guile Emacs at some point in the future. There's no real reason to be in love with Emacs Lisp. Guile has a lot of the same syntax. It offers a few additional features that we don't have on the Emacs Lisp side. It'd be nice to see. I don't know how long it will take, though. I don't know how many resources are being spent on the Guile Emacs project. But when it gets to that candidate status, I expect there will be many discussions on the Emacs Devel mailing list about mm -hmm. pros and cons and why we might want to move and why we might want to wait still for a little while. OK, all right. So also, um, so if those criteria are met, it's also possible to merge them right together, right? That way we can just have one and everybody contributing to just one source? Or am I like dreaming too much? <laughs> that, that would be the ultimate goal, would be to have Emacs become Max, And then the Emacs Lisp libraries that we currently have would run on Max in that compatibility mode. But there is a lot of ELS, Emacs Lisp code out there. Guile Max would have to prove itself adequate and compatible and performant enough to run all of that Emacs Lisp code, because that is where a lot of the value of the Emacs project lies, is in all of these user-contributed mo modules people have written over the years, many of which have not seen modifications in decades, but they still run just fine on, on modern Emacs, depending on how simply they were coded. So it's not a no-brainer. It's not something where, OK, as soon as they say they're ready for release 1.0, we're going to flip the switch. It's also not necessarily, that, necessarily true that it will happen. Emacs Lisp has been sufficient for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure necessarily what, the, there would have to be compelling motivators to make a switch like that, because it is going to come with some pain. OK, all right, yeah, those, those are valid points. All right, sweet. So. Let's see. So, what are your thoughts on Giles? You already answered that one. All right. So, all right. So, you were. So, there was a post asking how is uh, how goes the plan on basically putting use package into the Emacs space? So, uh, are you guys still planning on that, or, yeah, or how does yeah. that that will happen? Yeah? It's been uh, accumulating assignments, copyright assignments from the various people who've contributed over the years. And it's looking like it will be it will be in at some point soon. I just have to go through now. I have to take the list of everyone who is a contributor, and I have to match them up with all of the copyright assignments that we have on file at the FSF. And anyone who hasn't yet, after asking them if they will do it, if I don't get a response from them, then that code will have to be re-implemented. Mm. So it's it's in process. It will, okay. it will it will be in Elpa at least very soon. I, I, I won't say very soon. It will be in you know, <laughs> at some point soon. It won't right, take yeah. long because that is something I want to see happen. But it will not be in Emacs twenty five point one. All right. Yeah, you got to be careful with your words there, John. You don't want to say that's something. right. I have to be very careful. People <laughs> might think I'm using tomorrow. No. Oh, and by the way, I should say the Emacs twenty five point one pretest is is available. You can download it. You should download it if you're cons if you're interested in Emacs future. Please download that. Uh, pre-test release and try it out. Bring any problems that you have to the Emacs community by using MetaX report-emacs-bug. 
and let us know what your experiences with it are. Also, if anything about it feels clunky or off or weird, you can feel free to report that too. We're interested in all kinds of feedback to see what, sta what state this release is in. Okay, all right. So this question just popped into my head. Um, I remember reading that uh, someone was creating basically a new web page, basically a new a new website for uh, for the for the Emacs site. That's right, Nicholas Petten was working on that. All right, yeah. So basically, um, how goes that plan? Because when I saw it, the web page uh, it looked like a major improvement <laughs> from mm -hmm. from its state. So uh, how how does that go? I'm not sure where the last uh, post on the Emacs develop mailing list ended up. There, there were several rounds, several iteration of, iterations of changes between require, requests that the Free Software Foundation made about the visibility of the free operating systems over the proprietary operating systems in terms of where you get Emacs from, and also declarations about the intent and importance of various aspects of what Emacs is from a GNU project standpoint. And I, I believe Nicholas has made most of those changes, but you would have to come to Emacs Devel and ask him where the most recent version is and when we're going to be ready to move over. But I like it too. It looks much better, much more modern. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is just another uh, point, uh, a way of showing that not only that not just contributing code to the Emacs core. That's just not just that's. Uh, that's not just one way of contributing to Emacs. You can also contribute by doing things like, uh, as such as Nicholas is doing, or uh, or maybe even doing the 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 GitHub Phantom or well, whatever it was called, uh, Fabricator, and showing it to John and the other developers. So there's many ways to uh, contribute to Emacs, not just coding by itself. Yes, yes, absolutely. There are many, many ways. You're contributing right now by creating podcasts like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hopefully I can pump them out more frequently, but uh, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, do you have any questions or any um, things that uh, you feel that I should have asked you but uh, didn't? Uh, let me see. You might have asked. Let's see. What, what could you have asked? What would be the next biggest new feature I would like to see in Emacs? Because aside from bugs, there are some changes I would like to see Emacs adopt. And one of them, probably one of the biggest ones, would be some form of concurrency. The ability to have Emacs do more than one thing in its list interpreter at the same time. Because some of the largest Emacs packages we have, such as GNU's, are also ones I rely on daily. And whenever I hit G in my GNU's to have it go refresh and download whatever email is newer, if it needs to talk to IMAP, I'm waiting until that communication is done to do anything else with my editor, which is a big drawback if I suddenly remember something I have to do and I want to use org mode to enter that task in, but GNU's needs 30 more seconds because I want a slow connection at an airport and it's not done updating yet. So the ability to have GNU's do all of the work it needs to do while still allowing Emacs to be responsive and usable is something most modern editors can do, but we don't have support for that yet in the Emacs Lisp interpreter. There is only one piece of Lisp that can be running at any one time. And there are different ways to go about introducing concurrency. Not all forms of concurrency even necessarily imply asynchronicity. They just imply that Emacs can be in the middle of doing multiple things and then task switch between them as the user demands attention. Mm -hmm. But there have been a few candidate implementations. There's even, a there's even a concurrency branch that implements what you might call Java-style threading into the Emacs list core. But it's it's... A tricky question because it will introduce new kinds of bugs. It will make certain aspects of Emacs more surprising, more difficult to master for beginners who want to learn Emacs list coding. Uh, for example, say you're debugging an issue and all of a sudden something happens in another thread that you hadn't stopped. Mm -hmm. Should you now see that stack trace while you were looking at some other stack trace? Or should everything be frozen except for the thread that's doing the debugging? Those are all questions that would have to be have to find good answers before we would want to move to something like that. 
Because the single-threaded model, while it can be annoying at times, such as the GNU scenario I mentioned, it has the benefits of being extremely straightforward, easy to understand, no special documentation, no special skills are necessary. So I don't want to lose the benefits we have right now with the simplicity of Emacs underneath, but I do want to improve some of the usability. Okay, all right, sweet. But uh, yeah, that's basically all the questions. So the only thing left is to, you know, uh, from everybody in the Reddit post uh, and everybody in the Emacs community to tell you uh, thanks for being the maintainer. So thanks. yeah. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Daniel, for inviting me on to your podcast. Uh-oh, thank you for blessing me with your presence. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. No, no. All right, then, John, uh, talk to you soon. Bye. Okay, bye-bye.